You know, Jesus often used uh, parables to teach complex spiritual ideas, and he did it you know, in a down-to-earth way, easy to understand format. I mean, the parables themselves were dense, of course. They taught uh, very important spiritual truths, but they were couched in stories and uh, different, uh, different uh, narratives that were easy to understand at the time. So this evening I'd like to uh, borrow this approach, if you will, and share with you the parable of the arrow. Now that's not, you won't find that in the Bible, that's my parable, okay? So the parable of the arrow, and this parable is meant to compare arrows with churches. All right, so just from a curiosity factor, you know what I'm saying? Uh, 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 people are wondering, how is he going to compare an arrow to a church? And that's a good thing, because I know you'll stay with me for, for this thing. Well, let's first of all, let's talk about arrows, shall we? Arrows are a, um, an ancient and effective invention. Uh, if you go back to Genesis chapter 27, Isaac says to his son Esau to take your quiver and your bow and go out to the field and hunt game for me. So uh, arrows and bow hunting are among the earliest hunting tools of mankind. Very ancient, very ancient tool. Um, so we know that they've been used for a long time. We have even stories in the Bible about it, parable, uh, not parables, but uh, psalms uh, discussing and talking about arrows and so on and so forth. Uh, so I want to show you an arrow. This is the construct of an arrow, thanks uh, to Marty, he lent me an arrow. I do not own any arrows, I had to go out and borrow an arrow. But this is an example of a, a hunting arrow, uh, marvelously handmade, light, easy to carry, simple in design. So let's take a look at uh, the basic parts of the arrow. There's the tip here, very sharp. You might not see that, but this is razor sharp, very pointy. Of course, this here is the, uh, the business end of the arrow. As I say, razor sharp and deadly for enemy or game. Um, it's said that a good bow hunter can drop a thousand pound animal with just one arrow if he has to. So this is how deadly and effective these things can be. And then there's the shaft, this part right here. Uh, this here gives it weight and piercing power. Uh, it's the tip back here that comes into contact with the target, but the weight of the shaft is what gives the arrow its force to, to penetrate. And of course, shafts can be made of uh, various wood, like cedar, but other shafts use uh, aluminum, graphite, I believe, can be used to make the shaft, this part here, the long part. And then, of course, you have the, the fletching, or this group of feathers here at the back of the arrow, just before the notch or the knock, where the arrow is inserted into the bowstring. Bow and uh, Marty was telling me this little plume here at the back is like a guiding, you can see the arrow going, you see the yellow or red plume, gives you an idea of where the arrow is going. Now these feathers back here today, many of them are made out of plastic, extremely important because they give the arrow its spin, you know, the arrow has to spin and it has to, has to roll in order to keep it on target. When an arrow is released, what happens, and I don't want to break this here, but the arrow flexes up and down, okay, like bows, it flexes up and down and the feathers back here help the arrow to stop this motion and send it into a kind of a spiraling motion so it'll go straight sooner and thus travel further and truer to its uh, target. If it wasn't for the feathers, you, know, you, couldn't, you couldn't control the, the direction of the, uh, of the arrow, the, the spinning motion, if you wish, of the uh, arrow which is provided by the feathers um, if you didn't have the feathers, you wouldn't get that spinning motion, you couldn't get any accuracy. So in order for the bow hunter to be successful, he needs to use arrows that fly straight and true. And this requires that each arrow have a hard and a sharp tip, a strong and a smooth shaft, and properly positioned fletching. So let's talk about arrows and the church in this little parable. 
the church can be compared to an arrow and how it functions. For example, preachers, teachers, deacons, ministry leaders, missionaries, support staff, these are the kind of the business end, if you wish, of the church, a little bit like the tip of the arrow. They're the ones who are qualified and especially trained, and I, I put the, the, the underlining under the word trained, special training, and also commissioned as leaders in the work of establishing and building up the church in this world. The congregation, if you were, the congregation of the saints provide the strength and the support resources to carry on this effort. And so, in a way, the congregation is like the shaft, if you wish, of this arrow. They supply the weight and the power to drive home the spiritual warhead towards its target of a dark and lost world so that there'll be an explosion of light. And the difference between an arrow in life and an arrow you know, in the church is that when an arrow hits its target, there's death. Uh, but when the church hits its target, there's life. That's where the similarity changes. And then if I might, I would say that the, the elders are the fletching or the feathers. They provide balance, they provide direction, they provide stability for the entire mission so that the mission can stay true on course. So like an arrow, the church is pretty effective when all of its parts are in their proper place and in good condition. So if an arrow is in good condition, a good bow hunter will be able to use it effectively to, in this day and age to take down game. And if the uh, church is effective, if the church is well put together and all of its parts are working, then it is also effective to go into the world and preach the good news uh, to mankind. So let's talk about arrows that, um, arrows that don't fly because there are some arrows that won't fly. See, the thing about arrows is that they're not very forgiving. Not like a shotgun, you know? I, I've shot a shotgun a couple of times, and you know, I mean a shotgun, you know? Get it in the general area, you're going to hit something, right? But arrows are not like that. They're not very forgiving. If everything is not just right, they don't work. Uh, Bruce Johnson, another bow hunter, tells me that a good man with a, with a bow might make a bad arrow fly, but they usually have to be just right to actually work properly. So for example, if an arrow has no tip, you know, just nothing, if there was just wood here, well, it could fly far and it could go straight, but when it got to its target, especially if you're hunting, it wouldn't cause a whole lot of it wouldn't cause a whole lot of damage. You couldn't, you couldn't kill anything with it if it didn't have a sharp tip. Or if an arrow had a tip and fletching, but the shaft was too short. Well, the tip could be deadly, and, 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 and the feathers would be in place, but because the shaft was too short, it wouldn't go very far. And I'm speaking if you're uh, shooting an arrow like this on a conventional bow, not a crossbow where the arrows are a little bit shorter. But if you try to take a you know, long bow, that's what we call it, a long, if you try to take a long bow and, and, and shoot an arrow about that long, it wouldn't work very well. How about an arrow with a tip and a shaft, but the feathers that are all damaged, or worse still, no feathers whatsoever? This arrow not only wouldn't work, that arrow would be dangerous because it has no stability and no accuracy. You imagine shooting a, an arrow with a a, a, a very dangerous and lethal tip like this and long enough but with actually with no feathers, no direction or anything, oof, someone, someone could get hurt. So if arrows don't have all of their parts intact, properly positioned, they're still arrows, but they're arrows that don't fly. They're arrows that are not effective. They're arrows that might even be dangerous. So let's flip it over and look at churches. This is how arrows compare with churches. A church needs all of its parts working if it's going to be effective. For example, the business end of the church needs to be taking care of business. I repeat that, I like that line. The business end of the church needs to be taking care of business. 
preachers, deacons, others who lead in ministry, they have to remain focused on their jobs and remain sharp and dedicated in order to be effective. Those who are paid to minister need to be at the very head of our corporate effort. They're, they're right on the sharp point. They need to be first to see new possibilities and new objectives and new horizons and fields of harvest that are yet untouched. You know, I've been doing this for a long time. I mean, I've been ministry, in ministry for a long time and, and it's happened at times that I've been criticized for things criticized for things that I wanted the church to do. You know, when we criticize our ministers for forward thinking and forward looking, it's like being upset that the arrowhead is first to make contact with the target instead of the shaft or the feathers. It's like we're upset that the, that the arrowhead is too sharp, too deadly. I, I worked for a congregation once, I, I, I won't, it, it, it's not here, it was a long time ago. And I'd been there for about a year or so and there was a general meeting, it wasn't as large a congregation as this, but we'd had a great year, you know, and there were maybe oh, a dozen baptisms, I mean a dozen baptisms when you're a little church, you know, of uh, less, than a, less than 100 people, that's a lot of people being baptized and, and so on and so forth. There's a lot of good things going on in the church and, and so we had a meeting because there was some grumbling and some people were not happy about things, you know, and the elders, there were only two elders, and they said, well, let's have a meeting, let's have a general congregational meeting. And during the meeting, a lot of ideas went back and forth, and one person stood up and said, you know, the problem here is we just have too many people, too many new people coming into the church. And our preacher is spending way too much time you know, working with these new people and baptizing people and he ought to be out visiting the seniors. She was upset with me because maybe a long time ago now, but because I was the sharp end of the stick, because I was doing what I was supposed to be doing, leading, leading at least in evangelism. The elders were doing their job providing the direction, so on and so forth, and they had given me the task to get out there and you know, let's go, let's spread the word. But some members were upset because, well, because I was doing my job. Now, I'll tell you, heaven help a church whose ministry leaders have less vision and faith than the rest of the congregation. Ministry leaders need to be ahead of the game, not behind. Let's talk about the shaft, shall we? The congregation, in general, needs to support the work of ministry. Not everyone has a role of leadership in ministry. Not everyone is paid to minister. Not everyone ministers and serves in the same way. The congregation, as I say, is like the shaft of the arrow. It's the biggest part. It provides support and power to drive the arrowhead right into its target. We need every single member to do their part in cooperating and supporting the overall work of ministry in the church, not just in this congregation, in every congregation. You know, every time one member quits, every time one member doesn't do what they can do to help, every time one member does not, refuses to encourage the work of the church, all of us become less, and we become less able to function properly. It's like shortening the shaft on the arrow. No hunter in his right mind would shorten you know, this here. Wow, it's cold tonight, and I'm going hunting tomorrow, but maybe I'll just cut some parts off my arrows to make a little fire, and then you know, kind of work with some short arrows tomorrow. No hunter would do a thing like that. Imagine an arrow with half of its shaft missing. It's still an arrow, but it won't travel very far and it certainly won't do too much damage. Well, in the same way, churches that have ministry leaders working away with little involvement or support from the congregation, well, they're still churches, but they're not very effective in accomplishing their mission of evangelizing their communities and the world. Everyone is important. Not everybody can get up here and do the speech. And in the big scheme of things, getting up here and doing the speech, this is not the, the key idea. This is the part where we're encouraging everybody to keep going. 
The growth of the church, believe it or not, happens with those thousand and one little services, those thousand and one little kind words and gestures of support and prayers and visits that everyone does together, all of that coming together to, to as I say, coming together to drive home. So when Marty, Mike, or anyone gets up to preach the pointy tip, the work has been done here. And that pointy tip is able to penetrate the hearts, is able to penetrate the conscience, is able to penetrate the darkness that lives within all of us. And I've said it before, we, we sit here and one person gets up and says, let's say for the communion, and has some good things to say. You know, the, the one who presides over the Lord's Supper, three minutes or so, we'd like it to be three minutes, but anyways, three minutes or so, and, 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 and they have something really good to say, and it really helps us focus our minds on, on what we're doing. And we appreciate that one person that did that, but we never think that somebody came into the building on Saturday night and one by one filled all those little cups <laughs> and cleaned all the trays and got out the, the unleavened bread and loaded all those trays and got out all, the, you know, all of the mechanics. And somebody stayed up late selecting songs that would hopefully go with the message and so on and so forth. We only see the one guy, we only see the tip who gets up for three minutes and gives us some words to help us focus. But we forget the shaft. The ladies that came in and cleaned the building. The brethren that came in and prepared the communion. The brother who took time to prepare his songs. The teachers who cut out all kinds of things so that in their classrooms their material would be ready for children from you know, one year old to, to our teenagers. So that everyone who's finally gathered here, the guys who opened the door, the people who put on the lights, the guys in the tech, back in the tech room, and so on and so forth, they're the tip, excuse me, they're allowing the tip to do its job. So we see this part, but we fail to recognize that without all of this here, the tip would not have as much, as much effect. And then finally, for the church to be true to its calling and remain faithful to the Lord, it has to have good shepherds. Shepherds or elders must lead with godly character and example and involvement. If they don't, the entire church becomes discouraged and worse still becomes out of balance. Any bow hunter will tell you that if feathers you know, uh, that are frayed or missing, if that's what you have on your arrow, it'll seriously detract from the accuracy of his shot. Oh, the arrow may hit something eventually, but without all the feathers in place and properly positioned, you'll be telling stories of the one you missed instead of eating deer meat the following week. So just like the fletching on an arrow. The lesson for leaders is that it doesn't take much misalignment or neglect on their part to throw off an entire body from front to back. What elders and their families do or neglect to do and how they do it truly has a direct effect on every single member of the congregation, it seems ironic. Oh wow, the preacher's getting up and he's talking about elders and there's the elders are sitting right there. Well, they, the elders have to hear the gospel too, you know? You know, Jesus also used to say to those who listened to his parables, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Luke 14, 35. What he meant was, if you understand what I'm teaching, if you understand what this simple little parable means, then do what it says and heed its warning. It was the Lord's way of calling upon His audience for a response. Well, as I say, this was a short and brief parable and I'd like to finish this little parable of the arrow with the same kind of call. Those who understand 
that what I'm saying applies to them in some way, well, pay attention because I'm saying it for a reason. You know, a lot of times, uh, Marty, I'm sure, has this experience as well, or anyone who's preached, you know, you, you preach, whatever, and you, you, you're greeting folks as they leave the building, and in, inevitably, somebody's going to say, whoa, oh, man, you were stepping on my toes this time. Boy, I should have worn my steel-toed shoes because you were stomping on my toes, you know, and you know what my reply is? Repent. <laughs> Because if I was talking to you, then the message was for you. So let's not allow the business end of our church arrow to get dull and get distracted. Remember why and for whom you serve when you become discouraged. And let's not allow the shaft part of the congregation to become too short to carry the burden of the work that we've committed ourselves to. A lot of times, unfortunately, the saying that 90% you know, of the work in the church is done by 10% of the people is true. I can say, and I can say it statistically because I keep track of this stuff, that is not true in this congregation. We have much, much more than 10% of our people that are involved in the work. I mean, just look at our education program, the number of people that are actively involved in our education program from cradle row all the way to the auditorium class. I mean, right there, I mean, at least 25% of our congregation, at least 25% of our congregation are involved in that. So, and that's just one ministry. I ain't even talking about worship ministry and, Maintenance of the building. So we have a very, very, uh, we have an excellent involvement uh, uh, attitude here in this congregation. But you know what? The thing about preachers is they're never happy. It's never enough. They always want more. I'm always shooting for more. I'm, you know, if we have 70% of our congregation actively involved in, in ministries, then I'm talking to the other 30%, because I'd like that number to be 80% or 90%. Not because it does something for me necessarily, other than I rejoice when I see people serving the Lord and doing it joyfully, but it does something for you. It does something for you. Is there anything more joyful than serving the Lord? Is there anything more joyful than knowing what God wants you to do and that you're actually doing it? I want everyone to have that experience. You know, this morning we called on people, we said, hey, we need a man uh, and a woman to work in our children's Bible time program. And unfortunately, a lot of times people hear an announcement like that and all they see is the work part. They just see the work part. But what they don't see is the reward part. There's a tremendous reward that comes from serving the Lord, especially in this way. And if you don't, why do you think the brethren who are now doing it have done it for so long. Do you think because it was a drudge? You know, Alan and Patty, do you think it because it was a drudge that they've done this for so long? No, it was a joy. Now, sometimes even a joyful thing can be tiring, and I think they might need a break. Juice and Gary, same thing. Why do you think they've done this? Not for months, they've done it for years. Certainly ever since I've been here, they've been doing it. Why? because they get a great joy from teaching children about God. So when we offer, you know, when we say to the shaft here, we need more weight here to drive the thing on. Please don't just see the work part of the thing that we're asking you to do. Try also seeing the reward part that comes with the work that we're asking you to do. And then finally, let's make sure that our feathers are not missing in action 
or getting a little too frayed and worn out to be very effective. Elders carry a, a great burden of responsibility and sometimes that can be very wearying. And so my encouragement to our leaders is not so much an admonishment, but rather an encouragement to say, take care of yourselves. Make sure you have time for spiritual refreshment because carrying the weight of nearly 400 souls is, is quite daunting. Let's make sure that you are caring for yourselves. And I say to the congregation, let's make sure that we support our leaders and our elders and give them words of encouragement and prayers of encouragement and, and tokens of encouragement so that they will do their work uh, with a happy heart. Well, whatever the reason and whichever part you belong to, if you need to respond to Christ in some way, I mean, the, the response at the end of the sermon is usually you know, what we're asking. You know, people will come forward or you know, acknowledge uh, the need for prayer, hopefully uh, are ready to confess Christ and be baptized if they haven't done that, but there's a lot of ways. I've sat there when Marty has preached and have, and have not walked forward, but in my mind, I've said to myself, okay, yeah, this thing, he happened to mention something and you know, I'm going to have to deal with that thing from here on in. There's just no getting around it. I'm going to have to deal with that or I'm going to have to do better at that or, whatever, or I'm going to have to let that thing go, whatever it is. So I'm saying to you, in whatever way, you know, with a tip, you know, you're this part, you're the, whatever part you play, if you need to respond, either publicly by confessing your faith in Christ and obeying Him in repentance and baptism, of course, that invitation is always there for everyone. Or perhaps in a private way, you need to start fixing what you know is wrong in your life or too heavy in your life, whatever it is, whatever your attitude is in service to the Lord, whatever role that you play, then I do encourage you to make that decision uh, while we sing. You wonder, why the song? Why can't we just come forward? You know? Well, I think the song of invitation is there to give us a moment to reflect. We can sing, we can reflect, we can kind of make up our minds during that moment how we will respond, either in a private way, within ourselves, perhaps you and a brother, you and a sister, whatever, need to kind of talk things through. Maybe that's your response. Or perhaps you simply have to come forward and finally uh, obey the gospel, something you have been delayed uh, or you've delayed to do. Whatever it is, here we are uh, on a Sunday night at 5 p.m. We encourage you to do that. Brother Bob, here is a, a song of invitation. Let's stand and sing that song. Let's make up our minds in what way we need to respond. <laughs> 